Hey there, Pastor Vance. I wanted to hop on and, and show you a bit of the, the work that's being done here at 4 North Blunt Street at our new home. Uh, so I'm going to give you a quick walk around tour just so you can see the progress. Uh, construction is supposed to be completed in just about three days. So I'm really excited to see how that happens and also going to be intrigued to see how that happens. But uh, we'll keep you updated. I want to show you a bit of what we're doing here. So let me turn the camera around. All right, so we are walking in the front door in our foyer. This is where our reception desk is gonna be. And then we'll have our welcome center, welcome area, coffee bar uh, that will be in here. Um, and then we'll go around and we've got some office spaces that'll be created here uh, for different folks to work in. Um, our sanctuary is still a bit of a mess because they've got everything piled in the center as they're completing all of the construction. Uh, but you can see that the walls are being painted and, and things being patched up. This is our brand new sound booth. The AV team is so excited about it. Um, they're, they're almost complete with that. And so we're excited to see what technology uh, will bring and allow them to do great and wonderful things. Um, and then down at the end of this hallway will be our brand new kids space, a place for our youth to be able to have a hangout during the week and also be able um, to come together on Sunday mornings. Uh, we've got space in here uh, for that to take place. And then our pantry area uh, will be out here on the other side of this wall uh, for folks to be able to stop in throughout the week uh, and on the weekends to get food nutrition support. So we're excited to be able to, to show you this space. There'll be a lot more coming. Uh, stay tuned for, for what updates are, are coming about and uh, for when we'll be having the first open houses. As we are preparing to move into our new space, we want to invite you to a special uh, consecration worship experience that will happen in the new location at 3 p.m. on February 20th. That's Sunday, February 20th at 3 p.m. Special consecration worship experience with Reverend Wanda Floyd and uh, we'll be consecrating the new space and celebrating this new exciting chapter that God is opening in our lives. Uh, so we invite you to come in for that. We'll have a congregational meeting immediately following that uh, worship experience and then also a fellowship opportunity after the meeting. So we invite you to come February 20th, 3 p.m. Hi, I'm Brett T. Go. And I'm Sister Shirley. Oh, shoot, I forgot my church hat, Polly. Oh, man. That's what I have to do for the day. <laughs> and welcome to St. John's MCC. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know our alter egos, well, if you were here years ago, decades ago, you know exactly who these two are. But those mm -hmm. of you who do, hopefully sooner or later, you'll meet these two. <laughs> So, so this week we had another trivia question for you all. So, Polly, what was the trivia this week? Uh, the trivia question was, how many books are in the Bible? Hmm. Interesting. So, speaking <laughs> of the Bible, Fred, have you read all the books in the Bible? Which Bible? You know, that's a very good point. In fact, it brings us up to the answer of our trivia question. It matters on which Bible we are talking about. Most of us know about the Protestant Bible, which is the smallest Bible in existence. It only has 66 books. Catholic Bible has 73. I do believe the Greek Orthodox has up to 79 books. But the biggest one out there is the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible with 81 books. That's a lot of reading. Like, huh, that's a whole <laughs> lot of memorizing. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I know you've done it, right? No, I ain't gonna lie. I've read the books in three of the four Bibles, but the Ethiopian Orthodox, I have not touched that one. Mm -mm. Hmm. It sounds like a project. When are you going to start on it? <laughs> uh, one day. Uh huh. Because oh, I know you got all this, you know, free time on your hands. So oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, guess what I did this week? What did you do this week? I went by 4 North Blunt Street. 
our new home. Excellent. Oh my God, I cannot wait for you to see it. It is absolutely fabulous. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be a great space. It's gonna have some great partners to be there with us. I mean, brand new sanctuary. The sound booth is amazing. There's lots of welcome areas for people to hang out and get ready for worship. I can't wait for you to see it. You're gonna love I it. Can't, I, I can't wait to see it, but I will admit I will miss our old home. But luckily mm -hmm. for us, we're not saying goodbye yet. We got, we're still doing ministry on Maywood Avenue. So it looks like we're going to be in two locations for a while. So we're not saying goodbye just yet. We will have an opportunity to say goodbye when we fully move into 4, four North Blunt Street. So Absolutely. And, you know, one of the ways that people can help us to get ready for saying goodbye and saying hello is to help us, you know, help pack up and help us to unpack at the new location. And so I hope people will, you know, take time out of their schedules to help us with that project. I mean, it's going to be major, but we're going to get it done. we got lots of new opportunities coming up on this new location, so I cannot wait to see what God has in store for us. I can't wait either, especially when it gets warm and we can have pastor in the park. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that's going to be wonderful. I mean, it's, you know, Last Sunday, I went by there for a little bit, and a group of us walked downtown for, for lunch. It was less than two blocks to walk to the local restaurants. It's going to be, I mean, it's perfect. It's perfect. Perfect location. I'm, I'm happy. I'm waiting for it. You got it. Really, I'm looking Me forward to Me it. too. It's going to be awesome. Speaking of awesome, I think we're in for another awesome worship experience today. What do you think? I know we are. I mean, between the music, the prayers, the preaching, just being together online, worshiping God, is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Well, let's get ready for worship. Let's prepare our hearts and minds now for worship. Amen. Amen. am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. shelter 
from every storm. I, I have a friend, his name is Jesus. Lord, we come to you today just to say thank you. Thank you for calling us your friend. As the word says, a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. Lord, we thank you for also giving each other to be friends to one another. What we call here at St. John's, Jesus with skin on. Lord, I pray that you would bless every single person that's enjoying this worship experience wherever they may be, that right there where they are, that your presence will flood that room and that you'll let them know that you have called them friends, that they are called and that you have a purpose for them. We pray that you do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jim Manchester, pronouns he and him. You know how much I love to tell stories, and this is a good one. It's amazing that the biblical writers gave us so much of this story, so it's a long one. Please stick with me. I think you'll love it too. And a little background. Of all the famous love stories in our biblical record, like the stories about Ruth and Naomi, the romance of King Solomon that's found in the Song of Solomon, Daniel and his friends in Babylon, the centurion who came to Jesus about his servant, and including many others. This one is definitely my favorite. It's the story of David and Jonathan, found in the Old Testament books of Samuel. It picks up in the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel. By the time David had finished reporting to Saul, Jonathan was deeply impressed with David. An immediate bond was forged between them. He became totally committed to David. From that point on, he would be David's number one advocate and friend. Saul received David into his own household that day, no more to return to the home of his father. Jonathan, out of a deep love for David, made a covenant with him. Then in chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, the story takes a twist. Saul called his son Jonathan together with his servants and ordered them to kill David. But because Jonathan treasured David, he went and warned him. My father is looking for a way to kill you. Here's what you're to do. Tomorrow morning, hide and stay hidden. I'll go out with my father into the field where you're hiding. I'll talk about you with my father and we'll see what he says. Then I'll report back to you. Jonathan brought up David with his father 
speaking well of him. And then he said, Please, he said to his father, don't attack David. He hasn't wronged you, has he? And just look at all the good he has done. He put his life on the line when he killed the Philistine. What a great victory God gave Israel that day. You were there. You saw it. And were on your feet applauding with everyone else. So why would you even think of sinning against an innocent person? Killing David for no reason whatsoever. Saul listened to Jonathan and said, You're right. As God lives, David lives. He will not be killed. Jonathan sent for David and reported to him everything that was said. Then he brought David back to Saul, and everything was as it was before. But then... There was another twist of the story as it continues in chapter 19, and it's really good. I hope you'll read it. And then, <laughs> then when King David learns of Jonathan's death and becomes king, his deep grief over the loss of the, over that loss takes up the whole first chapter of 2 Samuel. Go read it. We'll skip over that one for now to hear how King David treated Jonathan's son found in 2 Samuel chapter 9. King David didn't lose a minute. He sent and got him from the home of Machir, son of Amiel in Lobadar. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, came before David, he bowed deeply, abasing himself, honoring David. David spoke his name, Mephibosheth. Yes, sir, he said. Don't be frightened, said David. I'd like to do something special for you in memory of your father, Jonathan. To begin with, I'm returning to you all the properties of your grandfather, Saul. Furthermore, from now on, you'll take all your meals at my table. Shuffling and stammering, not looking him in the eye, Mephibosheth said, Who am I? that you pay attention to a stray dog like me. David then called Ziba, Saul's right-hand man, and told him, Everything that belonged to Saul and his family, I've handed over to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants will work his land and bring in the produce, provisions for your master's grandson. Mephibosheth himself, your master's grandson, from now on will take all his meals at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. All that my master the king has ordered his servant, answered Ziba, your servant will surely do. And Mephibosheth ate at David's table, just like one of the royal family. Mephibosheth also had a small son named Micah. All who were a part of Ziba's household were now the servants of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, taking all his meals at the king's table. Thank you, God, for making sure we still have this story to tell. Passed on from generation to generation. Amen. If you've been with us, we're here in week four of our New Beginning Challenge. The hope in this series is for all of us to refocus and calibrate our heart toward things of God. And it's fitting. We have so many new things happening here at St. John's, and we've just started a new year. Each new year is a chance to reset. It's an opportunity to rethink how the year before went and to make changes. It's an opportunity to say, I'm going to eat differently, I'm going to work differently, or I'm going to live differently. Maybe you don't like the results you got last year, so you're changing how life is going forward. 
that's what this new series is all about. That's what this challenge is all about. It's about a new beginning. It's about starting fresh. It's about hitting the reset button on your life or areas of your life that aren't going the way that you want. It's all about taking time to refocus our attention on the most important things in our life. The first week we talked about new heart. We looked at the story of the woman at the well. The woman experienced a new heart because of Jesus. But it took her listening, prioritizing, and connecting with Jesus for that reality to happen. That's God's desire for us, to have a passionate, faith-filled heart. Then in week two, we, took, we looked at the story of Joshua and how the words God spoke to Joshua gave him ability to overcome challenges ahead, purpose, promise, and presence. We learned when we give the word of God our daily attention, we get a transformed, a new mind, if you will. Then last week we talked about prayer and how we go to a loving, good God who wants to answer our request and bless us and give us new focus, a focus on God and of things eternal, not temporal. Today we're looking uh, or talking about friends. We're looking at friendship. Friendships are important in our lives. And for some of us, we may think about the topic of friendship, and we might not think that sounds too deep. But the reality is friendships have a much bigger impact on our lives than we oftentimes realize. You can probably think of friends from your early childhood who, or in those formative years uh, and experiences of those friendships throughout your life, well beyond that season of your life, how they impacted you, how they continue to grow with you. Those relationships continue to have impact on our lives today. They shape how we do life, our values and our beliefs. They impact the beliefs that we still hold today. You can also probably think of some friends who were a little crazy and convinced you to do some crazy stuff. They might have been those friends your parents didn't like because they got you into more trouble than you really wanted to be in. But friends are those with whom we laugh together, we cry together, we make dumb decisions together, and then we even laugh about those. Here's the truth you'll find in Scripture. As we look at the uh, interaction of people in the Bible, we see God using relationships to accomplish God's will in everyday life. Time and time again, we see God using friendship to encourage, to support, and even to rebuke when we need help and need guidance and direction in our lives. That's why we see in, in Proverbs these words that say, wounds from, a, uh, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Friends are often uh, sources of encouragement. They are encouragement, but real friends also show us when we get off path. That is God's design. And it's why friendships are so important to us and important this year uh, as we grow in this journey and grow into all of what God wants us to be. So today we're going to look at a story of friendship in the Bible that will help us understand the power of great relationships and great friendship. I want to give you three characteristics from this story uh, here now, just as we did last week, and then we're going to get into all of these. First, I want us to think about the fact that real relationships overlook differences. Secondly, real friendships look out for one another. And lastly, real friendships look to carry on the blessing. The story we look at today is the story of David and Jonathan uh, from the Old Testament. And many of us may be very familiar with this story. But we look at it, it, it takes place when Saul was king of Israel. Jonathan was his son and the heir to the throne. Jonathan is set to be the next king of Israel. That's obviously important to King Saul. And let's be honest with ourselves, who wouldn't want to pass that on to our children to let them be the next king? We would all want that. Now, David was a commander in Saul's army. He was promoted in Saul's army because of the victory over uh, the giant, Goliath. We all are probably familiar with that story as well. There's another, uh, another really important detail as a part of this. David had been anointed to be the next king of Israel by the prophet Samuel, meaning God had selected David to be the next king after Saul. God didn't tell this to Saul. David had been anointed, but he wasn't king yet. And of those who knew, no one was quite sure how that was going to take place, how all this was going to go down. 
In the process, David joining Saul's army and serving at the palace, David and Saul's son, Jonathan, uh, the heir to the throne, the one who was supposed to be the next king after Saul, developed this very deep relationship. Look at what it says in 1 Samuel verse 18 or uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him uh, that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. The first point that we get to in this story is that real friendships overlook differences. If anybody had a reason to despise one another, it was David and Jonathan. Think about it. Jonathan was supposed to, to, to be the king. And he, he had every reason to be mad at David because here David is trying to step in and, and is anointed to be the next king. David, on the other hand, should have been ready to take over and to kill Jonathan because God had anointed him as king. They weren't even similar in upbringing. Jonathan was royalty. David wasn't. According to society, Jonathan was supposed to be the next king and David wasn't. Jonathan was a warrior from birth and David was watching over sheep. They were different, yet they became friends, best friends, and developed this deep relationship with one another. They didn't let their differences divide them. Now this is powerful. In a time when we are so divided, what could it be if we set aside our differences and started working toward loving each other, holding each other accountable, and working toward unity? Now, let us also understand that unity doesn't mean that I give up what I believe or I have to change what I think. I don't agree with everything that my friends think. Just look at your family. Or I'll look at my family or people in our extended family. Some of us are weird, right? Some of us uh, uh, laugh when we start to think about that because we know those folks we are talking about or we know ourselves to be the weird ones and that, that we're laughing with ourselves. Think of how different Jesus was from the disciples. Jesus is God. Can you imagine knowing everything? Literally knowing the answer to every problem? In some ways that would be cool, but other ways it's going to be extremely hard. It would be hard to keep quiet during problem-solving sessions. Imagine uh, the disciples getting together to try and figure out where money is going dur during their ministry trips. Now, this you know, is speculation. We don't have any written accounts of this, but it's kind of cool to think about and, and probably close to reality of what could have happened. Uh, let's imagine Peter saying, hey, we're spending too much money on eating out and, and on these meals. And James says, no, we're not spending too much money there. We're spending too much money on travel and hotels and donkey rentals. And then you got Thomas saying, I doubt it. If it was me, I would get frustrated with the disciples. This is where being ignorant can be good sometimes. Back to that old saying, ignorance really can be bliss sometimes. So there was a massive difference between Jesus and the disciples. Though there was this huge divide, God literally makes friends with human beings. Look at what Jesus says to the disciples in uh, John chapter 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what the master is doing. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from God. I have made known to you. Now this begs the question, why? Why overlook so much? For David and for Jonathan and for Jesus uh, and for the disciples. Why overlook so many issues? Here's why I believe Jonathan and David could have the relationship that they did and why Jesus could call the disciples friends. And this is so important because if we can do this, it will help us in every aspect of our lives. Here's what they did. Jonathan and David and Jesus all focused on the person and not everything else around the person. They were able to separate the person who, who was such great value from the circumstance, from the values and the beliefs that they held. They recognized the individual. Now remember, Jesus did not compromise on his beliefs, not in the least. And some hated him for it. But he was secure in who he was and what he believed. That didn't stop him from loving others who disagreed with him and even went as far as, as to die for even those who didn't agree with him and those who hated him. 
What a powerful example that is and it can be for us here today. If we look at ways we can apply that to our lives right now, what relationships in our lives do we keep at a distance because they don't uh, look like what we think they should look like? Or, or, or we don't uh, we keep those relationships at bay because the person doesn't look like us or, or act like us or talk like us or they don't believe like us? What if we kept our beliefs intact but we just listened and got to know other people? What if we weren't threatened by someone else's viewpoint? What if we used social media to make friends rather than enemies? What if we looked at getting to know the, the person rather than ignoring them because they do, uh, disagree with us on a particular matter or subject? We would have more and deeper friendships. The most mature people I've met are the ones who can connect and talk to anyone, yet they have a strong confidence and belief and values that they have and they hold on to. Real friendships overlook differences and allow us to grow connected to one another. Secondly, I would like to submit for us that real friendships look out for one another. Now, King Saul was jealous of David. Though David had done so much for him and was one of his best warriors, Saul became more and more jealous and wanted to kill David. David's success started to concern Saul that David might become king and he and his family would be replaced. Look at what Saul does to make sure that David doesn't become king. In, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 19, we hear uh, these words. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and, and to all of his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted so much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David uh, to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you. And because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand and struck down the Philistine. And the Lord worked great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and you rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David and, and uh, Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. Again, Jonathan could have had the throne. He could have just agreed and gotten rid of David. He would have been king. However, instead, Jonathan does the right thing. And at the expense of himself. And that's what friends do. They think about what is best for the other, even when it might cost them something. Again, this is what Jesus did. He left heaven to come here to earth. You've heard the saying, friends don't let friends drive drunk, right? Here's some other things that we might think about. Friends don't let friends give up. Friends don't let friends walk away from God or from situations they shouldn't be walking away from. Friends don't let friends become isolated. And here we, we need to understand this, that friends don't just don't let their friends do certain things. They also encourage the right things. Friends call you up when you're hurting. Friends push you to take the next step. Friends help you stay connected. Friends are examples of what we should be. These friendships give us the strength to reach the heights that God wants for us. It's this community of friends who is there for us. The angels that God has placed in our lives to help us along life's journey. The roots of massive redwood trees that we know about on the west coast only go about five or six feet deep. These really tall trees, they only run about five or six feet deep. However, their roots go more than a hundred feet out from the trunk of the tree. What happens in this root system is that those redwood roots start to intertwine with one another, with the other trees. And this makes each tree strong. And it gives it the ability to grow to the height that it grows to and to sustain itself. That's God's plan for you and me. 
God is using our friendships to, to provide that interconnection, to provide the stability that we need to grow to the heights that God has for us. Real friendship looks out for one another. Lastly, real friendships look to carry on the blessing. Time passes and King Saul dies in battle and so does Jonathan. David becomes king. And he wants to know if anyone from Saul's household is left. They find Jonathan's son and bring him to the king. Now, Jonathan's son was terrified for his life. He had fled as a child after Saul and Jonathan were killed out of fear that the new king would have him put to death to protect his own power. Instead, David says, I am giving you all of the land that belonged to your grandfather, King Saul, and I am going to welcome you at my table any time that you are here. Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan's son thought that he was going to die, but instead he found himself among friends. David is passing on the blessing of real friendship. I think we need to take a life lesson out of this, an example out of this friendship, and apply it into our own lives today, especially in today's society. We more, uh, have more ways now uh, to connect with one another than ever before. We must take that lesson of friendship and find ways to apply it in our ways of connectedness. What an amazing opportunity we have before us to connect with our friends locally and around the world and how we can uh, connect with one another and take these lessons and pass on the blessing of great friendship. Real friendships carry on the blessing. Now, let's get practical for, for just a moment and figure out how do we put all this into practice today. And there's actions that we can take right now. You can make friends through this uh, amazing community of St. John's Metropolitan Community Church in your local area, around the world, wherever you are. The most effective way to do that is to get involved in one of our group, uh, group ministries or in one of our activities that we have going on, whether you're virtual or in person. And so what I want to do is encourage you to sign up to be a part of one of those groups. And if you don't know where to start, you don't know what, how to get connected with a group, or you don't know which group you should start with, there's an easy way to, to find that out. And I want you to text the word CONNECT to 919-726-0727 or click the link in the bottom of your screen that are, or that's being placed in the comments now to sign up and say, I want to know how to get connected. Those messages will come directly to me and, and you and I will start a dialogue and we'll help you figure out where you can get plugged in in all of the amazing work we're doing here. God will use these friendships that we're developing now, those friendships that we're continuing to grow on, those that have been formed over the last 46 years of ministry here and those that are starting right now in these moments. God will use those to bless our lives and to, to sustain us and to give us what we need for the journey ahead. Let me take a moment as we close to pray for us as we continue this journey together. Or if you're joining us for the first time, we can start this journey together right now. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the many opportunities you give us to come together and to grow in our connectedness. The ways that you give us to develop lasting and true friendship. The growth that you invite us into because of that friendship and those relationships. We ask that you will bless us now, that you will remind us of your love, your grace, and your mercy. And show us how we can grow more and more connected. How we can be those friends that are an inspiration to those around us. How we, in our connectedness, can literally change the world simply by starting here with ourselves. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the gift of friendship. In your many names and in the name of love. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Vance, for that message. Uh, new friends are so important. Back in 2003, when I moved back to uh, Raleigh, I felt like I didn't have a friend in the world. It was one of the most awkward times in my life. And I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't have come in to St. John's MCC, come in the back door and sit down and try to, try to be a part of it. Over the years, St. John's continued to, to draw me closer and get me more and more involved. 
finding me more new friends, more new friends all the time. So I hope you'll hit that uh, connect button or, or, or type connect in the comments because that's the way to be able to get much stronger in your life. Now, there are other stories that people have, have about, about how St. John's has, has ministered and, and helped them grow in their lives. Listen to a couple of them. Uh, I'm still fairly new, although it feels like I've been here for forever. Um, I basically came to St. John's because it was the first church that I have ever attended that is extremely active in the local community. Um, St. John's does everything from social justice stuff to food pantry, helping people with meals, and then most recently, um, the emergency white flag shelter. And just coming here and hearing the pastor talk about how um, church is not about Sunday. Church is about what we do the rest of the week. And it truly impresses me and touches my heart to see how much St. John's does every week on a daily basis. So that is why I'm at St. John's. The beginning that I went out to tar Target and I bought myself a new hoodie. Now, some of you know very well that that is very unusual for me. In fact, I kind of like to think of myself as being thrifty, but my friends just call me cheap. One thing I try not to be cheap about is to is to be able to. <laughs> okay, uh, w w one thing I try not to be cheap about is to to be able to 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 be expensive in my prayer, and I want to be expensive in my giving to causes that are so important. And so, here again is a time for us to be able to turn our hearts and minds to generosity. One of the wonderful things about MCC is our commitment to inclusiveness. When we think of inclusiveness, we probably automatically think of things such as race, gender, sexual orientation, but inclusiveness goes way beyond that. And this morning in particular, I think about our youth. Within MCC, we are blessed to have various ages, from infants all the way up to seniors. And I'm reminded of a general conference a few years ago where we had a youth night. And the organizers of that service were very intentional when it came to inclusiveness, especially with young people. The communion that night, instead of having wine and or grape juice and crackers or wafers, was milk and cookies. There was Oreo cookies, there were vanilla cookies, there were graham crackers, there was milk, there were sugar-free cookies, lactose, tolerant milk, the list goes on and on. But that just shows way, one of the ways that MCC wants to make sure that there is a place for all at the table of God. And so this morning, our communion is dedicated to our young people. I'm reminded this morning of the young people who attend our facility at Maywood, our local church. But I'm also reminded of those in Kampala, Africa as well. To our kids at Kids Gear, we love you. We appreciate you. And we are very thankful to have you as a part of our family at St. John's. And so this morning, I want to read you a story. And if we have kids present, I invite you to gather your kids around so that they can hear this story as well. And this, supper, this story is the, supper, the story of the Last Supper. And it goes like this. A long time ago, John and Peter, two of Jesus' disciples, had arranged for the Lord's Passover. These were the last few days of Jesus before he would be crucified. The Passover meet the Passover feast was held in a house in Jerusalem. Jesus and all his disciples sat together and ate in one big room. And as they ate, Jesus spoke to his disciples. He told them he was really looking forward to this Passover feast, and he wanted to eat his last meal with all of them. Jesus took a loaf of bread, 
thanked the Lord for it and gave it to his disciples and said, This loaf of bread is my body. Jesus then picked up a cup of wine and once again, he thanked the Lord for the same. Offering them the wine, he said, This cup of wine is my blood. He said that as he, as he was ready to shed his blood for his people, that he would, that they would be forgiven for their sins. All his disciples ate the loaf of bread and drank the wine. The meal continued after this. It was a long celebration. The disciples took their time because they enjoyed talking with Jesus and asking him questions. Also, they sang a song to God together. After the meal was over, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples because he loved them. He wanted them to learn that they should do nice things for people also. And so this morning, I invite you to gather your communion elements, whether it be crackers and juice, milk and cookies, just a piece of bread and a cup of water. The elements themselves does not matter. It's the symbolism or what they stand for that's most important. Let us pray. Holy God, as we prepare to take these elements, these simple elements, we ask God that you will bless them, that they may be strength for our bodies, encouragements for our journeys, and a gentle reminder of the love that you have for each of us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let us now partake in the feast, the body of Christ broken for all of us. The blood of Christ shed for all of us. We thank you once more, God, for these simple elements. We ask God that you will continue to watch over us, that you will continue to keep us from all hurt, harm, and danger. And God, may we continue this fellowship. We ask God that you will continue to watch over our, our young people, our kids, that you will continue to guide them and lead them on the path that's best for them. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. We love you. We love you, kids dear. To all of our kids who are watching around the world, know that there is a place for you at God's table. We have a purpose. All of us has a purpose. So as I close out today, I want to invite us to do the same things that we have been doing each and every week and reminding ourselves of who we are. So repeat after me. I am, I am God's, beloved, God's beloved, deeply loved, deeply loved richly, gifted, richly gifted, highly favored, highly favored and, abundantly blessed. and abundantly blessed. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are. God's beloved, God's beloved, deeply loved, deeply loved richly, gifted, richly gifted, highly favored, highly favored and, abundantly and abundantly blessed. We are, we are God's beloved, God's beloved deeply, loved, deeply loved, richly gifted, richly gifted highly, favored, highly favored, and abundantly blessed. And abundantly blessed. Amen. Oh, the Caribbean. 
hope 